I say thank you, Jeremy Ponting, for taking part in this interview and for subjecting yourself to an interview uh, for the States of Independence Festival. I thank you very much. So Jeremy Ponting, for anyone that doesn't know, is the founder and managing editor of People Tree Press, which is a publisher based in Leeds, which I can say with confidence is the biggest publisher internationally of Caribbean books. So I wanted to talk to Jeremy about three aspects of his work. Firstly, I want to talk to Jeremy about, well, I want to talk to you, Jeremy. Sorry, I'm speaking directly to you. <laughs> I want to speak to you about um, history, a bit of the history of People Tree first, uh, your experience as, a, as, an, as an editor uh, for so many years. And then I want to talk more about the sort of process and the process of how writers might submit work, your, your process as an editor, as a publisher. And then finally, some more sort of political things with, with a small P, uh, just really looking at how uh, publishing and the sort of receptance of Caribbean writers has evolved over time, because I think we're at a really crucial juncture now. Um, so, you. yeah. You know, I, let's start with the history. I wanted to, if you could tell us a little bit about where People Tree comes from, where the beginnings are, where you started it. I mean, it, I mean, it begins probably around Leeds University, um, where you know where I was a student in the mid sixties, and Leeds at that point was was very much a centre for what was then Commonwealth Studies. It, it did the Journal of Commonwealth Literature. It attracted, you know, si significant numbers. I mean, these were the days when students from the Commonwealth, overseas Commonwealth, were able to come to the university without paying fees. And I remember taking part in a demonstration when the university started to charge right. fees, and was told by the government to do so. So that it, it, it was, it was a kind of that stage a very, you know, it was a, a campus with, with, with a lot of students from Africa from the Middle East, from India, and so on. Right. And they, they, they also tend, tended to be often quite radical characters. So, right. the, the, you know, for me, it was a kind of a, a kind of a, I have my own kind of radicalism, but it was also a, a kind of one ab about learning more about the kind of experience of people. I mean, I remember, remember kind of, um, we had a couple of, and you had a couple of comrades who, from the Sudan, and we were having some kinds of arguments within, I joined the, the Communist Party branch there. Um, and we were having some kind of arguments in the branch and we, he gave, me a, gave us a right all telling off mm. about, you know, how they, you know, they, how they had to operate. And here we right. were kind of luxuriating in, in kind of, so, so it, it, it was an education. And one specific part of the education was a friendship with Nguru Athiongo, who was doing an MA at, at Leeds at the time. Right. And he, but you know, he, he was about. He must. Nagugi must be about at least ten years older than I am. Mm. But he, we struck up a friendship. Um, I think it was. To be honest, I think he was over the Arab Arab Israeli War. Oh. When we I think we realised that we we were about the only two in the whole building who who, who took who took an anti colonial kind of right. on, on what, what what was going on there. So we had a good friendship, and he he was Nagugi was doing stuff on. He was writing about Lamming, C.L.R. James, and, and so on. So that was it, it, that was part. You know, it was part of my kind of thing of, of discovering more via these people. Mm -hmm. that, that was part of it. When I when I left the university, I went into teaching in further education. And the college I taught at had a significant number of, of, of African Caribbean students. They were on pre-nursing courses and they, they, you know, and I, I, I used to do stuff with them, like, you know, sort of, sort of classes outside of class, you know, they were interested in discovering more about their history, which I knew something about. Right. So the, you know, that, that was part of it. They, they taught me loads, you know, they, mm -hmm. they used to bring along the latest, the latest reggae discs and things, you know, so the, it was a mutual, mutual kind of, uh, of education thing there. Right. Then I start. Then I started. I mean, you know. So the the Caribbean had always interested me, as always part. And I and I think in a sense that in a way, I mean, Africa did too. But I think in the sense I I recognised that the Caribbean was more intimately part of British history. 
in 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 a way in a way that you know be, that the length of the length of the history the involvement of it and i remember things like finding um when i was still a communist and you know i left over czechoslovakia and things like that right. but the um but the, i found a copy of chedi jagan's book in 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 the in the cp had you know they had a little right. offices down at leeds market and read the the west on trial and you know then you you, you suddenly realize hang on colonialism isn't old it isn't gone right. Uh, right. just you know 10, 10 12 years before i was at university the british were invading Br british ghana and, and locking up their their you know elected leaders and so on. right that that was part of the part of the whole kind of edu education too um so i eventually started doing doing a doctoral thesis which took i mean it was a it was an MPhil start first, then it turned into a doctoral thesis. Yeah. And I, one of the things I was really interested in was the the, the kind of position of, of of Indians in the Caribbean. Um, yeah, the fact the fact that you know the Indians were a majority of the population in in Guyana were about mm. half the population in Trinidad. Yeah. Apart from Naipaul, nobody you know nobody really kind of looked at what what they were about or or what mm. what was happening. So that that was that was what my I did a thesis. It took took me twelve years, for God's sake. Wow, um, <laughs> longer than mine. Wow. I was well. I was working full time all the time. You know, okay. I, had, I, had a, okay. I had a I had a young family. Mm. Um, so it, it was a very 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 part time thesis. But you know, yeah, you know, I, I stuck at it, and that the thesis kind of. I mean, I, you know, sort of going to the Caribbean, researching there. Mm. meeting writers made me aware of the fa you know the fact that there was a, a kind of a, a layer of good writing that just wasn't getting any kind of ex ex exposure right um, and i mean the very first book we ever did called back down people came came out of that out mm. of that kind of that research kind of thing where th this guy called rupla mona who he, yeah his his parents were, were sugar workers cane cutters he 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 was perhaps the first generation to kind of, you know, sort of to escape a bit from that. Um, he got a few O levels. He was a you know he was writing. He was he was um, he worked he'd worked as a, as a bookkeeper on the estate and stuff like that. So that kind of, you know that that was a very immediate kind of you know sort of physical introduction to right. What, what that world was, and he was getting to get an understanding of that world, mm. and be objecting to the fact that most of the stuff, for, for instance, written about Naipaul, who, 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 in lots of levels I admire, took Naipaul at his own word, mm -hmm. without seeing, you know, without seeing where Naipaul came from and how Naipaul's way of looking at things had been constructed and so on. Right. So I was, in, I was thinking, you, you know, you couldn't honestly write about the area. Without really kind of immersing yourself in, you know, in the kind of the history and in in the the social structure of things. So I mean, I had a brilliant time, kind of, um, this would be back in 1976, of spending about six months in the Caribbean, just interviewing people, hanging out, talking, doing, you know, and doing quite a lot of library research. Right. Wow. And one part, you know, so that one part of that was. You know, sort of, be, of, be, of becoming aware of what you know what was there, and then sort of by the mid, you know, get, oh, going back after the, even. I mean, the thesis didn't get finished till 1985 when People Tree began. All right. <laughs> the, the, the two are the two, the two are not quite coincidental, really. <laughs> um, and kind of you know, I mean, I can still remember, for instance, that Mona he took he took me to where. The sugar estate where he'd been born was no longer didn't exist anymore. It was, okay. you know, but there was, you know, there were bits of kind of, um, of sugar estate machinery sort of, mm. you know, lying in the grass and stuff. And he, he, was, you know, he was doing things, you know, he he acted out stories from what became back down people, mm. and I, you know, I, I took took that on as a, as a, as a book as a book, and I think possibly at that stage this was a one off. Right. I think the fact that doing it kind of coincided with the fact of, of being aware that people like 
Hyman and Longman and McMillan and things who were doing who had their Caribbean writer series. Yeah, of course. Had were all being bought up by somebody else and were getting, you know, the African writer series was was killed off at that point by Hyman. Mm. And Rick and thinking there was, you know, there was important stuff there. Mm. And nobody was doing it. There was a there was a bit of a niche. Right. But you only discovered later why Hyman and Longman had, had sort of withdrawn from the market because it it wasn't a market that kind of um, was going to provide any. And that was never the point, but it, you could see why, 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 as soon as their accountants yeah. got them, yeah. they recognised that it was not a, it was not, not a long term kind of market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that 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 was where that was where People Tree began, mm -hmm. and grew. I suppose it grew out of the thesis in terms of being aware of, of good writers who were doing stuff. And being involved in doing sort of, um, uh, you know, of being a kind of academic at that stage, mm -hmm. um, of you know, going to conferences and delivering papers at conferences, and you know, yeah. all, all of that kind of you, you know, you're aware of what people are doing or trying to do and not being able to get published. And stuff. Yeah. So that, that yeah. was that was the beginning period. Okay, there's a lovely um, there's a lovely article that you've written on the People Tree website about the beginnings of the press, and I, I recommend everyone to have a look at that. It's uh, www.peopletreepress.com. Um, there's a lovely article where you talk about the beginning, the sort of really rough, raw beginnings of actually physical printing, which I think is interesting, and I think a lot of small presses have similar experiences. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about those early days of pressing books in your garage with these loud <laughs> machines and things like that. Yeah, no, I mean it. That, I mean it was kind of. I mean it was it was an in, yeah, and it was an important phase. Because it meant that for quite a long, I mean, I suppose we did it for about 20 years, really. That's a long time. Um, <laughs> and it, it was about being, you know, well, I mean, it, there's a simple econo economic thing that, that um, the, cost, the cost of a book is hugely in the, in the charges that printers make. Mm. If, you know, so if we were able to make books at that stage that basically cost the paper that you bought, Mm. At that point, I wasn't paying myself anything. Yeah. So but books, books were, but, I mean, I was able to because, you know, I, I mean, for a bit I was working part time. My, you know, wife was generous in the fact that she, you know, as a head teacher, she was reasonably well paid and so on. Mm. It's had all grown up. We had our kids really young, so they, they right. all float, float. You know, so it was possible to do. And um, yeah, so it, it was about a, being able to. I suppose punch above your weight in terms of being able to do more books than you would otherwise have been able to do. Yeah, I hated, I hated printing. I mean, sometimes it was quite satisfying. Mm. But, um, you couldn't. I mean, I always say you couldn't pretend you were William Blake. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you went and and kind of when um, you know. I mean, it's it's not. A, I mean, it isn't a phenomenally skillful kind of thing to do. Right. It is. It, it's a time-consuming thing. Okay. And the, you know, the, we got to a point where you recognise. I mean, and we did. I mean, we paid our way by not just by printing our own books, but doing a. You know, we used to basically run a printing business. Okay. So we printed for other small publishers. Okay. The lo local kind of you know sort of radical charities and stuff like that. Right. And newsletters and stuff. So it, I mean, some of it was quite quite good fun. But in the end, we recognised that that printing, you know, that making your own books got you somewhere. But then, I mean, there were all sorts of you know sort of things where, I mean, in one one sense, the kind of market for offset life their work began to fall away. I mean, as people, as organisations got their own websites, you know, then they they, uh -huh. they do their newsletters online rather than kind of getting yeah. them printed. So. It, it also became the point where we reckoned, so there was a point where suddenly, I mean, we, I suppose at that stage we must have had you know, somewhere between 250, 300 books that wow. we'd done by that, or perhaps 250 by that stage. Okay. But actually, you know, the, the, the backlist was doing that, the long tail thing. You right. Know, that, you know, things were not necessarily selling in massive numbers in, in kind of, but they were generating enough kind of income 
Okay. To make it to make a serious difference. I mean, you know, I mean, I think it's one says in Rose. Hang on, the books that are in the south are actually generating twenty thousand quid a year. Mm -hmm. So you know that when you then when you start, I remember doing spending quite a long time on a spreadsheet working mm. out because obviously if we, if we were going to print with print with somebody else, unit costs would go up. Right. It would also mean and, and it, it. I mean, we had a big choice. It was either investing heavily with money we didn't have mm. in running a digital business okay or or kind of getting out entirely and concentrating on being a publisher and right. at that point it, it became made that made sense to do mm. it, also, it also coincided with the fact that um, the arts you know we, we right at our beginnings the arts council hang on been going for about six or seven years and mm. the arts council had a, a scheme of startups okay they, they put in quite a lot quite a bit of cash it was about i think it was about 18 grand a year mm. and uh this this would be about nine nineteen ninety one ninety two um and yeah we, we we developed a i developed a business plan with me it's still just me at the radio at that stage mm. and, um the arts council was impressed i don't think they really kind of quite I think they were as naive as naive as I was really about out the thing. So for a quite a time, people tree operated two businesses, a printing business and a publishing business. Okay. Interesting. Um, with great difficulty because, you know, I didn't know anything about how you ran a printing business properly. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, then eventually we saw that, you know, either, you, either we'd have to kind of become a digital firm or we'd get out entirely. And that's, that's, that's what we did. Right, right. Because it, it was also the fact that you know that if you if you're running a printing business for other people, then your own books often have to take second stage in that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I could imagine so that. You no, know, you're not. You're not going to see any money from the books you do for six months. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I could imagine. Whereas if you're printing for somebody else, you know, you make them pay on pay pay on delivery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> that, so that, you know, there, there were some very practical cash decisions around right. about that. I wasn't aware that you, you, would, you ran a, a, public, a sort of separate printing business. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, and, and mo you know, mo most of the work was for the small publishers. Yeah, of course. And, and, and for indie, I mean, it was quite fun. I mean, there was, we had quite a good time. You know, there were, there were you know, sort so of individuals who'd come into the, come and see us as our thing. And I think we got work because we, because we, I think we treated people nicely. Right. Um, and so people, people who'd gone to, to other printers and, and kind of other printers were not good with women for instance. Mm. Right. Um, mm. and, and so, you know, they'd say, print, print, will you print me a thousand copies of my collection of poetry? And we'd say, we would do, but think think about it a bit. Yeah. How are you going to? So you know, we, we talk them down to doing two hundred or something. Right, 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 right. I mean, there, 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 you know, there was a phase where we where we were, I suppose, almost almost a kind of a community kind of printing kind of thing. Right. But then we we got out of, out of that round about two thousand and eight, nine, ten or something. Round, some around about that period. So I mean, we, we, for, for the past 10, 12 years, we've we've been okay. operating with that, and it, and yeah, and, uh, and you know, we couldn't have continued printing. Yeah. Okay. In, in that kind of way, and and I mean, part of it, what made that possible was that, um, as I was saying, we got funded right at the just for a three-year period by the Arts Council back in the early nineties. Then, then the Arts Council um, went regional. Mm -hmm. But they didn't transfer any money to Yorkshire that, that covered, covered. So we, we, I mean, we survived without any kind of funding for, I suppose, about 10, 12 years. Right. By you know, basically funding it by, run, by running a printing operation. Okay. Then, then we were invited to apply for, to become a regularly funded organization, mm -hmm. which we did. And then when, when the Arts Council opened, it, opened its um, uh, portfolio. Which I think they, I think was 2011. We mm. were we've been part of their portfolio since okay. that time, which made which made the need for doing printing work. Yeah. Okay. 
Fine. I mean, we'd like, we had to take on doing other things as well. I mean, like running writer development. Yeah. 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 Okay, I'm 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 going to get to that a little bit uh, later on, but I I wanted to shift now a little bit. I mean, thanks for that. That was really informative and really comprehensive. Very helpful, I think, for a lot of people. Um, I want to move to your work as an editor because one of the one of the interesting things for me personally was was working with you as an editor, sort of on on my two on my on the, on the two novels that I published with you, um, Kitch and then Frequency, and I remember having a conversation when I was in the middle of writing Kitch, I think, with Roger Robinson, one of your, well, my fellow uh, labor mates, we call it, um, the poet. And uh, I remember having that conversation with him and saying, hey, you know, I'm looking for a publisher for this book that I'm writing on Kitchener. You know, who do you suggest? And he says, man, try People Tree. And of course, I'd been aware of People Tree for many years, but I, I didn't know much about the press. I didn't know you. I hadn't met you at that point. So he was like, yeah, try People Tree, you know, try People Tree. Jeremy is an amazing ed editor. And I said, well, why, is, why do you say that? And he was like, you know, Jeremy's a man that will go inside of your Creole, you know. He will tell you when your Creole is wrong or right. And that was fascinating <laughs> to me. And he's absolutely right. So I wanted to know, how do you, as a, I mean, a, a Yorkshireman, essentially, how do you manage to get such a, a grip on the language and the idiom and uh, the express, expression of Caribbean writing? How do you see your role as an editor in terms of um, how do you immerse yourself in the text and become that kind of editor? Uh, I think, I mean, I think it's a, I mean, I think one of the things I always, I always do, and I would tell other kind of people who want to be editors that they have to do, is they have to hear every sentence in their head. It's at, it's at that it's at that kind of level that that you, you know, you begin to pick up what's clunky, what doesn't work. You know, you you, you know, you've got to think at the think at some point, the writers, you know, the writers got to will have to read some of this stuff out. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> is it is it readable out in in, in that kind of way? Right. And and. Um, yeah, so that that's that's one thing. So yeah, so it, it it's about reading really closely, um, and it, it it's I suppose as I suppose as the time goes, you you get more confident. But it's I mean it's always it's always a kind of a collaborative process. Mm. You know, you, you know that sometimes you know you know you sometimes you're not right. Mm. Some 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 there are times when you know, you think you might be right and the author's wrong, but you give away gracefully because in the end it's their, it's, it's their book. Mm. And if it's a book that you, you like and you, you want to think, yeah, then in, in the end the author has, has the, last, the last word on it. Right. And you, I wish they'd listened to me on that, but never mind. <laughs> uh, but, then, but, then to, but then, you know, uh, yeah, you learn, uh, you learn from that as a collaborative process. Mm. You, some, you know, sometimes you think, yeah, no, the author was absolutely right about this. You know, my, my instinct was wrong on, on that one. Yeah. But, you know, you, you've got to have that kind of sense. Obviously, obviously to some extent, I mean, you know, the, the six months I spent in the Caribbean was immensely valuable in terms of being able, you know, being able to tune in on to what speech actually sounded like. Right. So, you know, the, the, I mean, and I, I'd, I'd certainly say that the, the big, you know, that, I was always probably more confident with Trinidadian Creole and mm -hmm. Guyanese Creole than, than say with, with Jamaican, you know. Right. But you, you know, you have a sense when things are working and, and when they're not working. Mm -hmm. So yes, I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's any part of it. I mean, we're just, I'm just sort of being looking, working with a book of poetry, which moves very smoothly between Sort of standard English and, and Jamaican patois, uh -huh. and, and you know, yeah, that that sounds right. Mm. That's ha that, that's the way you know way that you know how how somebody would be talking, that they would be moving between those two yeah. those, those, those two kind of things. Yeah, but, you know, so, I mean, sometimes sometimes you, you know you pick it out as being all wrong. Right. You know, where, you know, where you can. You know, obviously you have to know the language enough when I mean sometimes when you sit down and you listen to somebody reading a story at, at a literature festival or something and you think oh god you know there are a series mm. of, of, 
a Creole Patois kind of cliche. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. You, you, if 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 you you know if you've read enough and heard enough, then you know that they're cliche. That's it. I think you know. I think one of the things I think as well is I I think you're kind of mentioning it there is that if you read a lot, I mean, you've had a history of reading you know Caribbean literature for for many years, so your ears, I think, or your just the way it's a language, isn't it? You you know the language. Yeah, yeah, you know the yeah, language. yeah, yeah. 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 Not a language, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay, so as an editor as well, when you get a, a book, when someone submits, and we're gonna, I wanna get into how you accept submissions in a sec, but when you receive a book, um, what do you look for in it? How do you identify whether a book is something that you wanna work with or whether it's, it goes in the trash heap? How do you, right. what decides that for you? I think, I mean, I, I, mean, the, the, I mean, the first instinct, I mean, the first thing is probably you know very, very quickly. Okay. Okay. And, and that, you know, so that, that, you know, you, 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 you know, you don't know if you're going to publish it at that stage. Right. But, you know, you might, you know, if you've read two or three poems, you think, yeah, 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 there's something going on here. Right. Or, or you, you, you know, you, you read, a, you know, a, a chapter or something, and you know always that somebody's first chapter is probably going to be the worst one in the book. Mm. But then, you know, but then if you persist, you think, ah, you know, there, there is a kind of, I can hear a voice here. Okay, and I can begin to pick up a way of looking at, looking at the world mm. that, that's that's there in, in in the kind of texture of the prose, the kind of observations made and things. So that's the very that's the very first thing, and I think with that, mm. then the thing doesn't go any further. It yeah, then then is the the thing where you know where you think yeah the, this is worth kind of looking at more closely, right. and then 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 there are the judgments about. Does it in fact do something new? Mm. Does you know? I mean, I, mean, I suppose there are two. I mean, there are two things that we got to. You know, you connect to. You know, one is you know you, you know what you've published in the past. Yeah. You know, we've we, we've done over I think that's over four hundred and fifty books now. Mm. So you know, your, your first thing is is it adding something to the stock of books that we've we've got? Is it you know is it is it doing something? You know, is there a slightly different voice here? Is there a, is it writing about stuff that somebody hasn't written about before, or doing it in a different kind of way? And then it's then it's it's making that thing about it, is it actually adding something to that whole the whole body of, of Caribbean writing? Right. So I mean, you know that that um, I mean I think I mean I think it's we probably find that oh, particularly in no it may maybe in our whole thing we probably probably publish more women writers than male writers. Okay. In, in, and, and, and part of that is, is in fact that that you know that until probably until the 80s, 1980s, mm -hmm. that was you know with a few exceptions that was a missing voice in Caribbean writing. Right, 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 right. Um, and uh, yeah, so which obviously isn't to say that all women writers write write well or anything like that, yeah. but that you know that there you know there is the possibility of some of somebody having something to say. Right. You want to one of the interesting things that, I, that we're looking at at the minute is um, a group, you know, a number of writers, all from Trinidad, all women, mm. I don't think who know each other at all, who certainly don't, not, not in connecting with me, but all going back to um, the Trinidad that was never written about by women. You know, the, Trini the Trinidad of the 1920s and 30s, the Trinidad of the immediate sort of pre-independence period. Right. Um, the Trinity, you know, all of whom are, are kind of, you know, sort of revisioning. Mm. You know, you know, so there, there, you know, there are, there are, you know, there are brilliant male novels of that period. I mean, I admire people like Earl Lovelace immensely. Mm. Earl has some, Earl has some good women characters. Yeah. All virtually, all, but all those novels, when they come down to the crunch, are written from a male point of view. Yeah. Which is fine. Yeah. Written by men. So yeah. the, you know, there, there, there's an interesting space where you know where where you're looking at how some a, a kind of a world that's been written about before mm. was only written about from one side of the story, right? And it, I, you know, so I find it very interesting that, that that you know there should be a number of all at the same time of women writers, yeah. you know, g g wanting to go back and relook at right what's what 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 has made the, what has made the past, mm. you know. I mean, I, I mean, you know, at the at the, at the minute Trinidad is it, 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 is in a, a state of turmoil about the kind of you know the, 
you know, the, the numbers of women who've been killed recently, yes. you know, murdered in, uh, and so on. What is, you know, what is there in the past which, which might, you know, which might give traces to why this is happening? Mm -hmm. what, what didn't happen? Who, what, in what ways did the, the, did the nationalist movement give inadequate kind of place to women and so on and so on? Right. You know, it's an interesting kind of way of, of, of re-looking at... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting stuff. Okay, so... Does, just, does that answer the thing about what, what the kind of way one... You yeah, yeah, absolutely, ab absolutely. No, it, it does that and it goes, into, it goes into something else, which is great, you know, it's fine. Um, I'm interested in the, in the submission process for authors, for new authors that would like or might like to submit work to people through what is the what is the process for them it's quite straightforward i mean we, we we you know we we run a submissible site right you know so so that yeah if, if you i mean if, if people go to our website and you, you track down the thing you find that there's actually a link to submittable mm -hmm. and the submissible site is one where you know you you put up your book you put up a bit of bio you put up a synopsis Okay. We try, we try and get to them as rapidly as we can. I mean, right. so there are times when we when submissions overwhelm us. Right. Of course. You know, and, 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 and you know, there are more than more than you know more than can be coped with. I mean, it's probably worth saying that, that you know that what what we have is as, as well as me. There, there are, I've got two associate editors. Okay. So the, the, there's Jacob Ross, who's our associate fiction editor. Mm -hmm. and what, things you know apart from working on particular books you know one of the things that jacob does is to trawl through the, the submittable submissions and to pick out things which you know look look interesting right right and, um, so that's one part of the process and kwame Dawes does that for the, for the poetry right and um, that's part of the process but the you know the other part clearly is um you know, we, 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 you know, we are, you know, we're always interested in, in, in what, in, in what's coming up new, mm -hmm. you know, you, we'd always want to have kind of some one or two can totally new faces and writers on the thing. Yeah. But also the kind of fact that you want to stay, uh, you know, you want to keep on supporting the writers who's, you know, writers whose work is developing. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you, you know, the, and I, I mean, and our, I mean, I'm, our thing is is never about. I mean, it may be that sometimes the book doesn't sell well for some reason. Mm. Like I think you still think it was a good book, and the next book coming up is a good book. Right. And we'll stick. Um, so yeah, so there there is always that. There's a kind of balance between, um, you know, so you know, so, so looking for new things. Yeah. And things and things like, for instance, things like the Bocas Lit Fest has been really important for us. Mm -hmm. They were kind of a showcase things for up and coming writers. Mm -hmm. But you know, there've been you know, there's been quite a, quite a few people who've come out through that process. Right. Of, you know, you hear them at the festival, you think, ha ha, yeah, they. Yeah. Um, so do you do you actively do you actively seek out authors? I mean, is it something you do if you come across someone's work and you're like, you know, I'd like to publish this person? Do you approach? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, yes. I mean, occasionally. I mean, it, so it's a mixture of yes. I mean, it's a mixture of things like where you hear somebody re doing reading, and you, and you know, at the festival or something. You think, you, you know, you go and say, look, you know, think about us when you've got you when you finish yeah. your book. Right. Um, right. Think about and then thinking about and then. Obviously, some things come to us via recommendations. Yeah. Um, you know, so that you know, so that Kwame might say, "I've been working with working with this poet from Trinidad or something." Mm -hmm. I think he'd really give it, a, you know, a good look. Um, I might have a recommendation for you soon. Yeah. So there are always, you know, so and again, I mean, the writers you've published when they when people make recommendations to you. Yeah. Then you always yeah. take them take them seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know that the, the, they you know they've seen something. Oh, let's 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 have a look. Yeah. So there's, the, yeah. The, there is that kind of process. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I have to say that probably too much comes to us that where people haven't tried to build some kind of writing CV first. Okay, so that's important then for you. It, it, yeah, it does. I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't kind of. It doesn't. It, it never it's not the reason why everything anything is turned down mm. but it's a symptom mm -hmm. you know the the the, the you know the, we're much more likely 
to publish something where somebody, a poet, for instance, has been sending their work out and getting it published in places. Right, 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 right. And, and, and you know, that's not, it's not a requirement, but, it, but it's, it's a sign that, that a poet has an awareness of, that, that they, that, you know, they, they need to start marketing their work, they see, need to start working out where it should be going. Right. And, uh, and yeah, so the, 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 there's, there's probably too much that comes which, where people haven't really thought about themselves. Mm. Or, you know, it, it's clear that people haven't really kind of read enough. Right. Compared to, work, compared to what they're doing with what yeah. people have been doing. So this is going to move on to the last section of this of our interview, of our conversation, I should say. Um, you know, moving from the submission thing, I remember years ago when I first started publishing my own work, when I first started, when I first got a publisher to publish some work for me. Um, and I asked the, the editor at that time, you know, are you get? I mean, there's this whole thing in public, there was this whole thing in publishing at this time. This was mid 2000s, where there were very few, there were very few black poets or writers being published in the UK. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I brought that to him and I said, you know, because I was probably the only one on his list at that point. And I was like, you know, yeah. why is there, what's with this absence? Why is there an absence? And he said at that time, you know, I would love to publish more black, black British writers, but they're not sending stuff to me. I don't get it. But it feels now that you're getting, you're getting loads. I, I'm interested in how that has changed why that has changed and that's a quick change it's, we're, we're talking 15 years you know which is a mm -hmm, short time mm -hmm, in, mm -hmm. you know what has happened between let's say 2005 and now that has main that has meant that there's a, a kind of a little explosion going on in black british writing what do you see are the main factors in that uh, um hmm. I mean, I think, I mean, I mean, some, some of it, I mean, some of it is to do with perhaps the increasing prominence of the, of the small number of writers who did make, you know, did, did make some kind of splash, uh -huh. you know, like the fact that things like White Teeth, yeah. Small Island, all yeah. of those, those things gained a, a, a proper national kind of, of, of attention. Mm -hmm. Um. So I think, you know, and, and so I think that, and I mean, to some extent, I, I, I think that probably writers who were writing out of a black British experience were more likely to get published than people writing out of a Caribbean experience. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I think I think so. I think so. I, you know, so and I, you know, so part, part of what People Tree has always been been about, I mean, it, is always about, you know, it, is about balancing. So I'm very, I'm always very interested in in that Caribbean experience, mm -hmm. and, and, and having you know, and having a view that it does make a difference where you are, mm -hmm. you know. So that uh, yes, I mean, our list is is very diasporic in that kind of sense, but I also also know that um, probably people who are actually based in the Caribbean were finding it harder to get published than than people who were in the UK. And, and until recently had less access to things like festivals, yeah. writer development programs yeah. and, and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, so that part of it was, a, was about recognizing, you know, that people, you know, that if you were actually living someplace, putting up with someplace, paying your taxes in someplace, then you were gonna write differently about it than somebody who was writing from memory and, and moving backwards and forwards and things. Which is not you know, which is not making a judgment about which is more worthwhile, mm -hmm. but just making a, a, a view that it's different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That 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 yeah. you know that that was what. I, I think. I mean, I think. I mean, it, I'll tell you something. At the minute, one or two, you know, some of the writers we've published in the past mm -hmm. are, you know, and you know, are approaching via their agents mm -hmm. with kinds of. Uh, request for advances. We, we know we know we, we know yeah. we can meet him. Right. So I mean, my view on that is, you know, make hay while the sun shines in, yeah. in terms of yeah. that. Yeah. So there is perhaps a moment. There is a perhaps a moment, and it's a moment of, I think, at the minute of opportunity and threat. You know, on the on the on the one hand, there is a kind of an increased interest mm -hmm. in what Black British writers have to say. 
Right. Uh, on the other hand, I think there is there is a very kind of threatening um, kickback from people who want to keep Britain white and they're in power. Okay. Okay. <laughs> And you know, so the the fa you know the fact that you know things things like the 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 group who who call themselves the common sense group who seem very far from common sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, there you know, there's a minister who's shut down who wants to shut down one of the projects we've been involved with, the colonial countryside project. You know, which is about telling truths about the origins of um, country houses. Mm -hmm the British countryside is has a colonial kind of resonances attached to you know the East India Company and right. slavery right. and there are people who just don't want to hear that story being in so that you know the, the um, Minister Dowden when you know is summoning people like the Arts Council and Heritage Britain um, and the thing to say look you know you're not spending a penny more on this kind of stuff um, so what, so what, what, you know, the, what the, you know, the, the, the common sense group want to do, their latest wheeze, is they want to put up 1,700 statues of people who've won VCs. Oh. So there would be 1,700 male statues wow. and about 10 wow. female statues. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, very few, and obviously very, most of, very few statues of, of people of colour. Yeah. So th there is a white nationalist thing going on at the minute, and I think we haven't recognised uh -huh. it firmly enough. So I think you know that there there is, you know, the, I mean things like wokeness, culture wars, trivialise what I think is going on about you know sort of talking about radically different visions of what the country could be. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I think the you know there is a post Brexit kind of vision of the country. Which mm. one to shut down on it, its diversity, its yeah. pluralism, yeah. It, the, its its kind of actual history in mm. a way it's kind of very quite frightening, really. That's really sobering. It's a really sobering. Uh, a sobering yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it kind of it kind of so, literally sobers you up and makes you think, oh wow, okay, yeah, that's true. You know, it's interesting stuff. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because it is it is easy to get lost in the in the sort of you know celebration of it and think, wow, we're we're doing so well now. You know, it's Caribbean writers, it's great. You know, it's really positive. I mean, you know, I feel it too. But then, yes, you are right. There is another side of it, and you know, I do wonder, as you say, how you know how long can it last? How long is it going to last? And we have to make hay while the sun shines, as you say, make it happen now. Um, it, you know, I think we've seen periods historically where there's been similar things happening, like in the f late 40s, 50s, there was a golden age of Caribbean writing, you know, with people like Naipaul and Selvon and Lamming being published there, and there was a, a thing. Um, and now there's a similar little, little something like that now. And I'm just wondering if, does this mean that we could finally say that we're part of the canon? Or is this just going to be another sort of phase that dies out? You know, that is a question. I mean, I it, um, yeah. I mean, I think it. I mean, I think it's. I mean, I think that you know the answer to that is, is multiple. Mm -hmm. that, it, you know, the, um, the, 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 you know, there is definitely a kind of a, a level a level at which. You know that. You know that publishing is an industry. They have shareholders. We, you know. They have, you know, they need to, they make profits. They're looking, you know, there is a thing of looking, looking for the, you know, you know, the newest thing that will attract readers. Thank, praise be the Caribbean has hit, hit that for a bit. Yeah, yeah. How long, how long that will last for? And, and that's a, you know, that's a purely kind, you know, some of those writers will stay, will build, build careers, will yeah. sell plenty, plenty of books and so on. Um, Part of our part of our experience is, is also to know that that, that 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 sometimes if somebody's second book doesn't sell, mm. then they get dropped. Yeah, and you know that um, you know so that that you know there is that commercial reality mm -hmm. of you know about about that. So that's you know that's that's one part of the thing. Mm -hmm. The part of the thing is is yes, I mean there there are definitely kind of it's a, perhaps it's a generational thing. Mm. That you know, there there is there is a, a kind of a generation, who of, of, of people in Britain who, 
expect the world to be full of people, you know, full of diversity, mm. who, you know, who, for whom it's, it's just how, it, how, how things are. Yes. There, you know, but there is also, there is also a, a, you know, a, a kind of a political kind of focus. Mm -hmm. Got the gov current government in power. There is a, perhaps an older generation. Yeah. We still haven't got over the war. <laughs> it was still, you know, a long, 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 long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I think you know there are all those things. All those things are, are kind of you know sort mm. of operating at operating yeah. at the minute. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I want to sort of bring things to a close by asking you um, a broader question about the future. And I mean, uh, as a publisher who started off really humbly, as a humble, you know, conscious publisher who decided, you know, I'm going to I'm going to try to do something here because there's something missing. I say, you know, you're smiling, but it is a humble, you're a humble be beginning, <laughs> right? Starting doing your own books and stuff is really, you know. To now, the point now where you have, you know, you have sort of regular funding from the Arts Council and you're sort of a, I wouldn't say a mainstream, well, you are in a way a mainstream press, aren't you? What is the, what does the future hold for a company like People Tree? Is it more expansion or is it more of a, do you have a different vision? What is the vision for the future of People Tree? Um, I, I mean, well, I mean, there, there, there are a number of things. What, I, th I mean, I, I mean, what is I think you know the, the things like w winning the Costa Prize mm. will probably enable us to perhaps take on somebody else to do to do more marketing work. Good, 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 good. Yeah, and promotional yeah. work, and that 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 you know that will help. So I, I think I, I think we're probably more interested in selling more copies of the books we do than necessarily increasing, you know, sort of doing doing more books. Right. Um. Yeah, so I mean, I think to you know, so to to do fifteen to eighteen really good books a year mm. is you know is is a decent kind of contribution. And if we can sell those books better, then that that so so yeah. much the better yeah. for that. Um, there is I mean, there is clearly a. I mean, there is a point at which I will will, will retire. <laughs> you know, age will retire me at some, at some yeah. kind of point. So yes, I mean we, you know, we, it is something that we're we're kind of looking at thinking about how we ensure succession. Mm -hmm. You know how we can, you know, sort of get put it put ourselves into a form where mm. things can can continue. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, the, I mean, I, I well, I'm I'm 75 this year, mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, there are things I'm committed to, like you know, that there is an arts council cycle which comes up. I think in 2023 for a bit. So I'm, I'm committed to making sure People Tree is part of that cycle. Right. Um, in, you know, in term, unless the minister tells the Arts Council that we, we, <laughs> we can't be in it. <laughs> but but, the, but um, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a point, at, point at which I think somebody younger with fresh ideas would, mm -hmm. be, would be good for People Tree. I mean, yeah. I, I, probably, I probably won't retire in the sense that you know, there'll be books I will continue to want to do. Sure. But, you know, it would be, you know, it would probably be quite nice to have a bit more leisure, mm -hmm. you, know, bit, you know, and sort of uh, work on the projects that you really want to work on. Than, yeah, of course. Than, than day, the, 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 you know, the, you know there, there are things to be said about being, mm -hmm. having daily work. It keeps mm -hmm. you going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're, you're committed to being an independent uh, an independent sort of uh, self-contained entity. Yeah, I mean, no, no I mean, <laughs> nobody has come along yet and said, "Can we buy you?" <laughs> I mean, it, and I don't know what I, you know, and I don't. I mean, I don't know what I was, what would say were the happen. I mean, I yeah. think, have to think, think very hard about it. Yeah. But <laughs> in the end, you'd kind of think, well, is this would this be a real opportunity for the writers we've published? Yeah. Or wouldn't it? Yeah. Is it, uh, would it be just an asset stripping exercise? Yeah. I wouldn't be into it. But I mean, if, if, you know, if there was a, a big publishing firm who, who, who could convince you that they were genuinely kind of yeah. curious about it and would yeah. make you an imprint and would stay, stay loyal to the, the, you know, the values of that imprint, then yeah, you might, be, you might look at it at least. Yeah. It might, it might give authors kind of more, clout behind them than, than a small press can give them. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think, but, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm not into the assets tripping. Yeah. No. Yeah, no, I think it's, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how the business works, the publishing industry and stuff, but I, I would imagine that a press like People Tree are kind of, it's beyond the realms of, of, a, of a publisher buying that and sort of control, having a controlling, complete controlling interest in it. I, think it. I think it's too big a press for that now. I think you've done too much. And I think there's too much books and too much history. Um, it'll be very difficult. Yes, I think, I mean, I think, I mean, the, you know, the, the minute is about finding a successor. Really. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. Who, who, you know, who, yeah. yeah, because I mean, I think, you know, the, there is, I mean, there are parts, you know, the, the, you know, the, there are parts of the press which, which would continue with it without mm -hmm. my kind of thing. But I think, I mean, I think we, we, you know, we need, we would need to find somebody who can, you know, who, who is committed to, delivering books in the best shape they could possibly be mm. yeah so, and that's you know that's that's you know i mean if you're doing 15 18 books a year it's a full-time job yeah yeah of course okay cool oh, so yeah. um yeah that's 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 really good i just just a final point about uh, it kind of reminded me while you were talking there about um something that penguin has just done they've just put out these six sort of black british classics uh, right. Yeah, I wanted to, what your relationship was with the past in that sense. I mean, I know you have a series that you do sort of publish sort of books from the, the 40s and the 50s as well. I wondered how, um, if that is something that you're going to continue doing, de developing that backlist, historical, the historical list. Yeah, yeah, very much so. I mean, I think, I mean, we, you know, we probably are committed to doing perhaps two or three of the Caribbean modern classics mm -hmm. a year, a year. Um, you know, so the, you know, the, there's quite a bit more to go on that. And one of the things that I, you know, we, we've, I mean, it, you know, part of it's limited by you know what 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 is actually out of print, what where you can pin somebody down to get the rights for it. You know, mm -hmm. there are books where no, nobody knows who, what's happened to the author, their family, or you know, or who is the literary executor or anything. So yeah. the, you know, the, 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 there's stuff that requires a bit of detective work still. There are some important books that we, I don't know. Don't know who 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 we can get the rights from. Right. A, but I think yeah. But the other thing is, I think I mean, at the minute, it's a very male list, and that's inevitable. Yeah. Given that we, we've been doing the books of the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Yeah. Um, I want to. You know, the next phase is moving the classics into the 80s. Okay. And, that starts picking up a lot more women writers. Right. So yeah, I think you know the the, and I'm just to say that the, that that classic series, the, the inspiration really for that was um, was something like John La Rose really, and the the fact that you know that that, that John La Rose was was the you know he you know he 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 saw the the importance of balancing publishing new writing mm -hmm. against. Um, recuperating the important writing of the past right you know, one who, who republished binti ali first yeah 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 he, he published mendes mendes 1930s novels and yeah. so on yeah um, yeah and I, yeah so i think i mean one of the things i mean what one of the people i'm i suppose yeah there are lots of lots of important things i mean like discovering uh, rediscovering andrew Salkis, uh escape to autumn pavement and and, and the first gay black british novel really mm. there uh, published in the 50s or right. about the 50s and, and things like um i mean things like going back to mittelholzer yes uh, you know who you know who used to be really really big yeah and um i you know i think was kind of i mean his books went off i think badly at some point as yeah. because you know, the balance of what he was doing and but if you go back, if you go back to Mittelholz's early books, they're so ambitious in terms of what they're attempting in a literary kind of sense. And you know, yeah. So you, you know, part of the part of the kind of motivation mm -hmm. of the Caribbean modern classics was making sure that contemporary Caribbean Black British authors had access to those books. Yeah. Measure themselves. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, we should be pushing on from that. You know? Yeah. See, let's see what people were doing in the 50s and 60s hang on yeah. I, I mean sometimes we sometimes have to say that sometimes that some of the manuscripts that we get still mm. come through submittable 
you think you haven't read anything since the 50s. <laughs> You're still doing the same same stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. I want to say thank you for your time. I mean, we've we've You're we've it's been so rich and enlightening. And yeah, I mean, you know, thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks again. Thanks again. You're very welcome for doing it. Um, right. Yeah, and anybody that wants to check out People Tree, please uh, do www.peopletreepress.com, uh, and please order some books. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.